and I had to record it again in my office. First Corinthians tonight, we're we'll picking up in chapter three and verse five. So it's a rather long reading here. We're talking about building as we read these verses and make some statements about it. First Corinthians three five and following. Who then is Paul? And who is Apollos? But ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. I had planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are fellow, we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed, revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. Therefore let no man glory in men, for all things are yours whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours. And ye are Christ, and Christ is God's. We're going to talk about a master plan of unity, a master plan of the church and master of victory and glory. As you notice, Paul's talking about building. Talking about building the church, not brick by brick a building, but we are the church. And that's what he's talking about now. And he's still referring to the fact that there is division in that Corinthian church. We have to remember that church in Corinth, they had a lot of problems. Church today has a lot of problems. So that church in Corinth was something. You know, when a pastor of a church resigns or retires, the lay leaders, usually the deacons or the elders, they'll try to determine what they desire in their next pastor. Oftentimes, they'll take a poll of the members of the congregation and ask them what they desire next in a pastor. The result of this type of poll usually will result in a basic unity concerning the church mission in the community as well as in the mission field. But it's also interesting to see how many of the expectations concerning a new pastor are contradictory to each other? For example, one member might say, the new pastor needs to be available to every member of the church at all times. Another member is going to say, no, the pastor can't be that available because the Bible says he needs to prepare to work and study and be ready to preach. And then those, those who are going to say the pastor needs to be one who's respected in the broad spectrum of the world. People know who he is and he, he's invited to speak at different churches all the time. And there are others who are going to say, 
We don't want someone who's gone all the time just when he has vacation. Some will want a minister who's a good counselor and others, well, they want somebody who's always counseling. Many times there's problems which arise because of the different ways in which the members of a local church perceive the way he should lead. You see, you think, what's he talking about? Well, I'm going to tie it all together for you. In this letter, Paul illustrates how disagreements in the church there in Corinth had grown from the fact that the members misunderstood the true role of the apostle and the teacher. You know, a pastor is a pastor teacher. That's what it means. He's a teacher. They misunderstood that role. And Paul is trying to correct that situation now. He begins this discussion by the way he and Apollos related to the church. I want to read those verses again so you hear exactly what Paul's writing. Who then is Paul? Who is Apollos? But ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. I had planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So neither, so then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his labor. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. You see, what's the first thing? Who's Paul? You know, early in the letter, it's just some follow Paul, some follow Apollos, some follow... Who's Paul? And who's Apollos? We're workers. God has called us as ministers. Yes, but we are doing something. I planted, Apollos watered. But God gave the increase. Don't focus on me. Don't set me up here. God gave the increase. We're just fellow laborers. He makes it clear that the church is God's field. And he and Apollos are merely human instruments that are used by God for the purpose of preparing that field. You know, if somebody doesn't get a field plow and somebody doesn't plant and somebody doesn't water, that field's just an empty field. And that happens a lot when you talk about church. If you don't plant those seeds, nothing's going to grow. But what he says, okay, I'm planting Apollos water, but it's God that gave the increase. It's true if you have a garden in it. You can plant tomatoes or whatever you want. You take care of them, but God gives the increase. You'll take credit for it. Look at my tomatoes. God did that. God, you know, think about it. You take a seed, you take that seed that's dead, you put it in the ground, and it lives. God is trying to give you a message. Jesus' dead body went into the tomb. He raised again alive. So the first thing we see is that Paul and Apollos were servants, but they each played a different role. And they, and they, they introduced the Corinthians to the gospel. They introduced them to God's word in different ways. They, they built, it's just like the Bible. The Bible starts out simply, gives you the basic facts, and it's built it's progressive revelation. It's basically what Paul's saying. I gave you something. Apollos gave you some more. And other teachers probably also. So the first, you know, the Apostle Paul used the agricultural analogy in which he likened the role he played to, in preaching the gospel to planting the seed. And then he says, after I planted the seed, you know, I couldn't stay here all the time. Someone else had to come along and, and feel the role. There comes Apollos. He watered. He continued to build on what I told you. Doesn't that happen over the years? Think of all the pastors, one after the other, and they just keep building. That seed just keeps growing. They keep watering as God brings the increase. Here's the important point. Paul and Apollos were not in competition with one another. They were partners in a common undertaking. Team members in a common task. Apollos knew that Paul had a role. Paul knew Apollos had a role. You know, it's the same everywhere. 
That's, you have your roles to do. We're not in competition. It's also needed to be clearly understood that while their work was extremely important, they're subordinate to God. Because God is the one who provides the increase. You remember earlier, we're followers of Paul. We're Paul. Forget that. Look to God. Yeah? We are fellow workers. We're laborers. It's like bowing down to an angel. They're going to say, don't do that. And Paul said, look to God. He's the one that's doing all this. I didn't do anything. I just brought the word. Remember we talked about Elijah this morning. He took the word. And that's what Paul was doing. You can plainly see that Paul is stressing the fact that there were divisions in that Corinthian church that were caused by giving more devotion to the servants of God than to God himself. You, don't, you have no root when you do that. And Paul keeps always hammering that point home to them. I can tell you that this particular problem found in the Corinthian church continues to plague the church today. It seems there are so many communities where you find Christians who are divided simply because they give greater loyalty to, the, to one of God's servants than they do the Lord. You see this quite often. There's so, people are so dedicated to an individual that that pastor might be called to another ministry. And half the congregation gets up and follows him. They never ask, Lord, where do you want me to, you want me to stay here? You want me to go? They're so involved in following him and not God, they don't ask. You need to follow the Lord. You know, sometimes when you ask the Lord for guidance, he gives you this giant billboard, doesn't he? With lights, solar lights like we have on our sign down here. Now, and you just can't miss it. Other times, He doesn't give you that clear sign. It's, you just have to be patient and wait till it comes into focus. Because we're not going to have an angel come and give us the Word. And you're going to have bright lights and that sort of thing that some people claim. You have to pray and listen and follow the Lord and not some man. You know, there's a common problem in the world today. I call it the personality cult. I do. That's what I call it. Because... It's become a part of the secular life and politics and business and education and medicine and in theology. You know, you're going to find that any of those fields, they're going to be very strong personalities. And they gather disciples because they're strong, strong personalities. And people will follow them because of the way they think and the way they act. And you know, a lot of people follow, for example, Pastors, evangelists who are good looking, know how to speak, wear those nice thousand dollar suits, and people are impressed by that. What do they say? Do they point you to God or they point you to themselves? And in a lot of cases, they're just pointing to themselves. They want you to follow them. But this is a fact of life, it, it's affected the church, and it has a dis divisive effect. Because what's happened is we find ministers and churches and denominations who are today competing with each other. Hmm. The cause of the divided church is forgetting that we are all, all of us, servants and ministers of one Lord, one God, Jesus Christ. And that both the field and the harvest are His. We get too involved in us. And you know what happens when... That takes your focus off of the Lord. Now, when we take the words of Paul, what he wrote here, and he wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, remember that. This is God's Word. And then we uh, apply it to us right here today. It means that we're not only partners with everyone else who's at work in the church today, but also with those who have gone on before and those who will come after us. Because we didn't do it ourselves. There have been people before you for generations who have done the work of the Lord. And if the Lord doesn't come in our lifetime, the Lord is going to bring people who are going to continue to do that. We have, we're not in competition with them. We should rejoice when we hear of 
the church down the street or church up the hill that someone will say we should rejoice and not be jealous because we didn't have one. And we're not jealous what a mission, missionary says we have one saved. There shouldn't be competition between churches to steal people back and forth. We should not get the sense that there's competition between fellow pastors. You don't need that. And that same spirit should also prevail with those who preceded and those who are going to follow us. There have been church families in the past and, and it continues right up today that have been hurt by leaders who are so anxious to make a name for themselves they cannot seem to appreciate and applaud the work that's been done by those who preceded them. I've not met people. They think they are the only ones who's ever done any work for the Lord. It doesn't work that way. You know, I'm the last of a long list of pastors who served here at Montvale. Every one of them has worked for the cause of the Lord. Some were here for a short period of time. Some were longer. Some men God used to provide the land, to build the building, to win people to the Lord for salvation, and, and, and to generate this church with a sense of missions. They've done that in the past, and we build upon what they've done. It's important. The same sense of partnership needs to be among the lay people, the church members. It needs to, to produce a feeling that every one of you has a unique role in the ministry. You know, God's going to join all of us together. He's going to bring your the, the labors that you do, the gifts that you have, He's going to bring it all together for His purpose. His purpose. Not yours. His. If everyone had the same gift, we wouldn't get too far, would we? We have a lot of different gifts. And God uses that. And He has a plan and a purpose. So those deacons... We talked about early on that nominated committee were of different age and experience and education, vocation, personality. When those, each of those men took their office on the, the board of deacons, the church was at a different place of their needs. You know, because some may have been on there for years and different needs at different times. It's amazing though to see how the character and personality and interest of those deacons who are serving the Lord, maybe they're elders, they would match exactly the need of the church. And that's what happens when you open yourself and understand that God is the one providing and not you. It's just like having your piano player and the pastor come up with the same hymn. You see, you're working together. Again, we need to be supportive of each other. And the thoughts, and not be thinking at competitors. We need to always remember we are fellow laborers. We labor together. Don't be jealous because somebody does this or does that and you wanted that position. We're fellow laborers. There are no small positions. You know, Paul described very accurately the relationship when he says that different servants at different times do a particular job but that the Lord is the one who gives the increase. It doesn't matter how hard, how lazy, God gives the increase. I'm going to hammer that home because I don't do it, you don't do it. We do what God calls and He produces. The source of, of real unity among Christian workers is that we all need to realize that we're servants of the same Master and the source of unity in the entire church is that we are all products of God's grace. There's not one person in this sanctuary tonight that was saved in a different manner. You were all saved by grace through faith. Every single one of us. We're all equal. We all have a job to do. And may I add that disunity comes when someone believes they run the church, they have a desire to run the church, or thinking they're better qualified and they know more than the man that God has called to lead, be the spiritual shepherd of that church family. 
Far too many times you find far too many churches that have way too many chiefs and not enough Indians. That happens. If God places someone in leadership, trust Him. Disunity comes because of that is caused by individual pride and it can and will destroy a ministry and has a lasting effects on the ministry, lasting effects on your witness. It comes like disunity. A, a church that splits, a church that closes its doors is a witness that we don't need. There must be an understanding in this church, like every true Bible-believing, Bible-teaching church, that it is God's church. It's not my church. It's God's church. And He will run it by the men He personally calls to run it. In verses 10 to 15, Paul shifts his analogy from agriculture to building. And the emphasis from God's part in the work to the need of those who need to work in the church to be responsible. I love the way that Paul, well, through the whole Bible, but Paul does the same thing. He takes what we know. First, agriculture, a lot of farmers. Now he's going to take building. People understand about that. And he takes the physical, just as Jesus did, to demonstrate the spiritual. Because we're simple people. We need that blueprint to see. It's simply amazing to me to see how Paul walks really a very tight line. He's almost like a tightrope between man's part and God's part. He speaks ever so clearly and directly when he states in verse 7, So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. You see, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Paul tells us, that no one should feel their work is not important. So he turns the discussion to the need of those who lead the church to function with responsibility. What you do, don't think too much of yourself. Because when you do, pride enters in. And we know about pride. You know, Paul felt strongly that it was wrong to say, it's all up to God. And it's just as wrong to say, it's all up to me. That's what he's saying. We can't just sit back and say, well, God's going to do it. We are laborers together with God. Did you notice that in verse 9? With God. We have a responsibility and God will do His part. We are fellow laborers with Him in the work of the church and in spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world. Paul considered himself the wise master builder of the uh, Corinthian church because of having begun the work there and having nurtured the believers during the first year and a half of its existence. Paul was there before the first person came to know the Lord and he laid the very foundation of that church. But he told those Corinthian believers, and this is important for us to hear because it applies to us right now today also, regardless of what he had done personally, the true foundation of the church is Jesus Christ. When he says he laid the foundation, he's saying, I told you the gospel of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> I told you about the death, the burial, the resurrection. That's the foundation that I built this upon. That's Jesus Christ. Here's the point. Paul is making here, even though the church might have had a variety of builders and different materials. It had only one foundation, and that's Jesus Christ. So many times people think, when you talk about a church, they think about the building. Paul makes it clear, we're the church. The foundation is important. The foundation, Jesus Christ, that's the church's real basis of unity then. It's the basis of unity today. Verse 11 tells us, for other foundations can no man lay that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now this reminds me being up at Caesarea Philippi over in Luke chapter 6. Who do men say that I am? And what did Peter say? No one said a word. 
thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And so, this is what Jesus responded in Matthew. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, a pebble. And upon this rock, this boulder, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The foundation of the church, he told Peter before that while the church was still yet future, I shall build my church upon this rock. Not Peter, not what Peter, he's, he's, he's a pebble. The rock is what he said, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. When Jesus was talking about building a house, I think Donnie might have read this in Sunday school this morning. He's like a man which built a house and dig deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, the steam barrel beat the storm beat vehemently upon the house and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. And that's what the devil cannot shake this house were built upon the solid rock of Jesus Christ. Peter's not the rock. Don't let anybody ever tell you that. But what he spoke of is. Here's the foundation. It comes from the words of Peter. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. That is the foundation. Jesus is the rock. He is a solid foundation on which a church is built and upon which, which it continues to stand today and will continue to stand until He snatches the church out of here. Now, Paul also informs us that there's a distinct possibility of different quality of work being laid upon that original foundation. You only have to read the words gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, stubble, and it stimulates a picture in your mind, doesn't it? Of valuable things and worthless things. Things that are costly and things that are cheap. Things that are permanent. Things that are temporary. And that's the whole point. He wants you to understand that your works should be those things which are valuable and costly and permanent against those things which aren't. There was a missionary who was preparing to go into the field and his home church, before they, he was sent out, had a special service for him. He was uh, kind of to set him aside, much like the church at Antioch uh, did for Paul and Barnabas, set him aside. And at the close of the service, about a dozen people spoke about this missionary. One had taken care of him in preschool. One worked with him during his teen years. One led the choir that he was in. Another first introduced him to the idea of mission field at a midweek mission study group. There was an expression in every one of these people's speech and in their lives of a feeling that all the work, all the time, all the energy, all the study, and all the commitment was worth it for this one man who was going to the mission field. You see, the work of those people with that one man was gold and silver and precious stones. The work that they did from the time he was a little fella to the time he went out those doors and headed to the mission field, that's the work that lasted. As I read Paul's writing, it seems that he's suggesting that it's not always possible at the time to tell the difference between the valuable kinds of work that are done and maybe not. Because we tend to look at things with worldly eyes. Sometimes we see things that look as they're really not. The untrained eye can easily see the difference between gold and straw, but it's not always easy to evaluate what's being developed and accomplished in the church. That which seems to be deep may actually be shallow, and something that which creates great excitement may soon be forgotten. A lot of people play on excitement and emotions. There's an idea that of many that you need some type of entertainment. It only lasts a few minutes. Something which seems good, it seems like gold, when it's actually nothing more than hay. Oh, I got so excited. And you get to the car and they turn the radio on and they've forgotten all about it. It's hay. 
You know, Jesus illustrates it in the parable of the soil when he discusses discusses seed that's sown in shallow ground. It won't take root. You can't try to entertain people to salvation. It doesn't work. They need to hear the Word. You have to plant that seed and you have to plant it deep. There are times when something seems just plain ordinary and it might turn out to be extraordinary. Something important. That which creates conflict and may prove to be most redemptive. You just don't know. Paul doesn't elaborate his point, but he does promise eventually that everyone will know the difference because their work is going to be tested. The analogy that he uses is a test with fire. We know about that. You know, fire is not going to destroy gold and silver and precious stones, but it's going to consume wood and hay and stubble. We know how that goes too. The day Paul says when he declares a true value be built refers to the time when Christ shall come again and the world will be judged. And there's a sheep and a goat judgment coming. The day of the Lord in the Old Testament was a term that basically meant God's coming in both judgment and deliverance. It's an end times phrase. All of us who work in the church need to do so with an awareness that there's going to come a time when everything we've done is going to be tested. And I mean everything. It's going to be tested for its absolute and true worth. Not what we think it's worth, but what it's actually worth. It can be a day of reward or it can be a day of loss. But the one thing you have to remember, if you're a believer, you may not get those rewards, but you don't lose your salvation. You can't read that verse and tell me that's not eternal security. Your works might be burned up, but you're going to be saved. Along with the fact that all we do is going to be judged, Paul now discusses the possibility of either reward or loss. You're either going to be, and if you get that crown, that's wonderful. But what are you going to do with it? You're going to cast it back at Jesus' feet. But we need to be moving that direction. I always must think of Lisa when she was here. She always wanted to talk about the crowns. She wanted those crowns. And we all should desire them. Those of us who are nervous about any discussion of future rewards have missed the very obvious teaching that just covers the Old Testament and the New Testament. When the disciples asked Jesus this question, but what are we going to get out of following you? What, what, what rewards do we have? The Lord, without hesitation, said they're going to be a hundred times better off in this world and even greater experience in the world to come. Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, there is no man that left, home, left house or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels that he shall receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the world to come eternal life but many that are first shall be last in the last verse. The rewards are coming. They're there. We have the word of the Savior on it. You know, Jesus rejected the common notion that rewards would be materialistic. And we live in a materialistic world. People want that type of reward. He affirmed the fact that there's a relationship between what we become and do and the reward that we'll receive. We need to work for Him knowing that everything we do is for His honor, for His glory. You know, his discussion here is not about salvation. Paul's not talking about coming to the Lord for salvation here. He's talking about the works that the saved person should be doing. And it kind of reminds me of what James tries to tell us over in his little letter. Not works for faith, but faith that works. 
remembering that whatever we do, we are fellow laborers. And if we do it with the right heart, using the Word of God, God will increase what we plant. May we pray. Father, I thank You for the time tonight and for this message from Corinthians. We are fellow laborers, Father. We know that. And we know that we have a job to do. And we need to do it humbly because You are the one who provides. We need to plant those seeds. And we need to continue to water them. We need to teach and continue to teach. And we need to learn and continue to learn. Father, I pray that You would continue to work in us that revival in our hearts, a desire to serve You humbly and understand that You are the God of creation and You love us and You love those people outside that door that don't know Jesus. Help us, Father, to get that Word out. And I pray that if there's one here tonight who has never accepted Jesus as Savior, that this would be the night that they would say yes and come. And whatever the need is in every heart, Father, work in a mighty way there. Thank you again for your word and for the time that we've had today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.